back once again to the Imaginary Gallery. It is TJ, your host. We're on the list of warning signs for abusiveness. The next on the list that we are covering from, Lundy Van Groft. Why does he do that? Inside the minds of angry and controlling people. The next one on this list, it's never the right time or the right way to bring things of importance up. Bancroft tells us that in any relationship, it makes sense to use some sensitivity in deciding when and how to tackle any type of difficult relationship issue. There are ways to word a grievance that avoid making it sound like a personal attack. Ha! If you happen to mix in some type of appreciation, you increase the chance that the partner will actually hear what you're trying to say. But with an abusive person, no way to bring up a complaint is the right way, which <laughs> I've learned on more than one occasion. You can wait until the calmest, most relaxed night or afternoon. You can prepare the partner with plenty of verbal stroking, express your grievance in very simple and mild language, but guess what? It still will not be willing to take it in. Initial defensiveness or hostility toward a grievance is common even to non-abusive people. Sometimes you have to leave an argument and come back to it in a few hours or the next day, and then you'll find the partner's actually more prepared to take on what is bothering you. With an abusive person like this, however, that's toxic, the passage of time doesn't make any difference. It doesn't spend the intervening period digesting what you said before and struggling to face what it was he or she did. No, that the way a non-abusive person might, in fact, it does the opposite, appearing to mentally build up its case against your complaint as if it was preparing to go before a judge. Next on the list, he or she undermines your progress in life. Interference with your freedom or independence is considered to be abuse. If this partner causes you to lose a job or to drop out of a school program or discourages you from pursuing whatever it is in your dreams, causes damage to your other relationships, takes advantage of you financially, and damages your economic progress or your security, or tells you that you are incompetent at anything that you enjoy, such as writing, singing, artwork, business, as a way to get you to give it up. This person's trying to undermine your independence. Next, it denies what it did. Some behaviors in a relationship can be matters of simply judgment. What one person may refer to as a raised voice, somebody else may call yelling. And there is room for reasonable people to disagree. But other actions, such as calling someone a bad name or pounding a fist on a table, either happened or didn't. While a non-abusive partner may argue with you about how you are interpreting his or her behavior, the abusive person denies its actions altogether. The next is the abusive person justifies his or her hurtful or frightening acts or says that you made him or her do it. When you tell your partner that the yelling frightens you, for example, and it responds, I have every right to yell! You're not listening to me. That is abuse. The abusive person uses your behavior as an excuse for its own to stop using a degrading or intimidating behavior. Instead, this type of person insists on setting up a quid pro quo, Dr. Lecter, where it says it'll stop some form of abuse if you agree to give up something that bothers it which often will be something that you have every right to do. <laughs> Next, it touches you in anger or puts you in fear in other ways. Physical aggression by someone towards the partner is abuse, even if it happens just one time. If it raises a fist, punches a hole in the wall, 
throws things at you, blocks your way, restrains you or grabs, pushes or pokes, or threatens to hurt you, that is physical abuse. It's creating fear and using your need for physical freedom and safety as a way to control you. Call a hotline as soon as possible if any of these crap things happen to you. Sometimes the partner can frighten you inadvertently because it's unaware of how its actions may affect you. For example, it may come from a culture or from a family where people scream loudly and wave their arms around during an argument. While from your background, people who argue are quiet and polite. The non-abusive man or woman in these circumstances will be very concerned if you inform him or her that it's frightening you and will want to definitely take steps to make sure that doesn't happen again. And that would be something that's unconditional. But the physical abuse is dangerous. Once it begins in the relationship, it can escalate over time and become more serious assault, such as slapping, punching, and joking. Even if it doesn't, the so-called lower-level physical abuse can scare you and start to affect your ability to manage your own life. Any form of physical intimidation is highly upsetting to kids who are exposed to it. No assault in a relationship, however minor, should be taken lightly. Bancroft tells us that he is asked on many occasions whether physical aggression by ladies towards men, such as a slap in the face, is abuse. The answer is, it depends. Men typically experience ladies' shoves or slaps as annoying and infuriating rather than intimidating. So, the long-term effects are very minimally damaging. It's rare to find a man who has gradually lost its freedom or self-esteem because of a lady's aggressiveness. Lundy objects to any form of physical aggression in relationships except for what is truly essential for self-defense. But he also reserves the word abuse for situations of control and intimidation. A lady can intimidate another lady, and a man can be placed in fear by its male peers. And a man can be placed in fear by his male partner. Most of what he's described about the thinking and tactics of heterosexual abusers is also true of abusive gay men and lesbians. Next would be he or she coerces you into having sex and or sexually assaults you. He's had clients raped and coerced by their partners repeatedly over the course of a relationship, but has never hit them. Sexual coercion or force in a relationship is still abuse. Studies, he says, indicate that ladies who are raped by intimate partners suffer even deeper and longer lasting effects than those who are raped by some kind of stranger on the street or non-intimate acquaintances. If you've experienced sexual assault or chronic sexual pressure in your relationship, he once again advises you to call the abuse hotline or a rape hotline, even if you don't feel that the term rape applies to what was done. The next one on this list, the abusive person's controlling, disrespectful, or degrading behavior is a pattern. His or her controlling, degrading, disrespectful behavior is a pattern. This item is as important as the others, but requires the most judgment and ability to trust your own instincts. When exactly does the behavior become a pattern? If it happens three times a year, once a month, once a week, <laughs> The answer is, there is no answer that applies to all actions and all people. You will need to form your own conclusions about whether your partner's mistreatment of you has become repetitive. The last one on this particular list, you show signs of being abused. All of the other indicators we've covered regarding abuse involve examining what the other person's doing and how he or she thinks but it's also equally important to look at yourself. You need to examine such questions as, are you afraid of him or her? Are you getting distant from your friends or from your family because he or she tries to make those interactions difficult? Is your energy level motivation declining? Are you depressed? Is your self-opinion declining so that you're always fighting to be good enough just to prove yourself? Do you find yourself constantly preoccupied with the relationship itself and how you can fix it? Do you feel like you just can't do anything right? Do you feel like the problems in your relationship are all your fault? And do you repeatedly leave arguments feeling like you've been messed with? 
but you just can't figure out what's going on or how. These are the signs that you may be involved with an abusive partner. You may notice that all that we just covered in the features of abuse include little mention of the word anger. While chronic anger can be one warning sign of abusiveness, the two are sometimes quite separate. There are cool and calculating abusive people who rarely explode, and at the same time, some non-abusive people feel and or express anger on a regular basis. You might decide that you don't want to be with a partner who's angry all the time. Lundy would not care for that, but that's not abuse in itself. I am the narcopath. I know that shortly after I dumped you, you noticed how quickly I started to date your cousin. Don't blame me, honey. It's your fault for introducing us at your graduation. If you hadn't have invited him and me there, I would never have even known him. But because you did, I took a look at some of his personal records and found he was worth way more to me than you could ever be. It's quite natural that he fell for me shortly after. Of course, I told him all kinds of twisted versions of the truth, which ended up leaving him to be turned against you. It kind of ruined your family a little bit, but hey, it was worth it. <laughs> I got his money, and I got out of there. So now that I'm out of there, you might as well know, everything he knows about you was lies. I made it up just to turn him against you. And of course, I'm very good at that. I've been doing it my entire life. I'm the best liar you'll ever meet. <laughs> Even though it's not ironic how I swore to you I was so honest when we first met. <laughs> well, honey, that's not my problem. You shouldn't have listened to me. You should have known better. <laughs> I'm a liar. <laughs> but ooh, he was so much better than you. And at least he let me get his money unlike you. And I'm on to the next now. Ta-ta. Oh, yeah. And that time that your aunt died and you missed the funeral, you wondered how that could have happened. Well, again, guilty. The thing was, I really needed your attention during that period. It really bothered me that all this news was coming forth about her health and... But I can't be bothered with that. I don't even know her. The point was I needed you. I needed you to help me with the project I was working on, which of course, to gain the love of somebody else that you didn't even know about, you thought that maybe your phone was malfunctioning because your family had called you on so many occasions to give you status updates, which I heard every single one of them. Guess what I did with those status updates? I deleted every single one of them. I did not want anything to interfere in my plans. <laughs> Too bad. So when the funeral came and went, and your family was furious at you for ignoring all their calls, well, I just pretended like I had no idea what was going on and thought maybe it was your phone too, and told you some made-up stories that I've heard that brand of phone does that. <laughs> Never you mind now. And of course, now it's all over anyway, so who cares? It wouldn't have mattered if you went to that funeral anyway. Just thought I'd let you know. Mm. I am the narcopath, and I miss you. Do you miss me? I know I'm the most beautiful one you've ever had. <laughs> you must think about me sometimes. You must. I've become more beautiful with age. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>